wait, wait, wait. The Ravens did what? They did? Why? Good morning to you. Good Monday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of Steelers. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into hockey and or baseball. I also offer Daily Shots of Penguins and Pirates where you found this. Remember, no matter how your favorite team schedule breaks down, six of the 17 games are going to be inside the division. And that's going to go a long, long, long way always in determining how your team does. It can never be overstated, the importance of tracking within the AFC North. And it can never be celebrated, maybe quite like yesterday when the Ravens, for some insane reason, signed Odell Beckham Jr. to a one-year deal worth a maximum of $18 million, a minimum of $15 million, most of the latter coming in the form of a signing bonus. Why would you do that? Well, you don't have a quarterback. Lamar Jackson still isn't in the fold, and you might not have a quarterback to throw in the ball even if you have Lamar, but I digress. You don't have anywhere near the caliber of a contending football team to be adding an $18 million player who isn't going to make much of a difference for you anyway. The MVP version of Lamar was on the ground. All of it was on the ground. Almost all of it was on the ground. But the general attack, including the approach, the multiple running backs, all that stuff when it caught everybody off guard, and the Ravens were really smart to do that at the time, no longer applies. Never mind the not-so-small consideration that you don't have Lamar back yet. So what are the Ravens doing? Why are they doing it? Real easy answer for you. I don't care. Okay? I just don't. I look at the division right now, and you can call me whatever you want for this. I look at the division as being Cincinnati, then Pittsburgh, and then whatever the heck happens between Baltimore and Cleveland. I think the Ravens have kind of played their way out of that top two, mostly by having stuck with the Lamar concept for too long, or not having stuck by it emphatically enough and committing to it for a longer period of time. What can you expect at Point Park University in downtown Pittsburgh? Respect, rigor, relevance. That's the Point Park pledge. You'll be treated with respect while being challenged and supported academically to graduate with career-ready, relevant skills. Visit pointpark.edu to learn more. To me, it feels like Steelers versus Bengals, and I put the Bengals at the top for a very obvious reason. You know, they've gotten it done. They've gotten to the playoffs. They've gotten to a Super Bowl. Steelers aren't doing that. Steelers haven't done that. And, you know, if you look back, especially over the first half of last season, the Steelers' offense was close to catastrophic. So we can all make all the forecasts that we want about the greater glory of, you know, uh, Kenny Pickett, Najee Harris, George Pickens, and everything else here. But until that offense actually puts it together, never mind being hamstrung by Matt Canada's presence, you're going to have that as a variable. You just are. But the question here today, again, is where does that line up within the AFC North? Wherever it is that the Steelers are, what's it mean in the context of the division. And to me, that means the Bengals, because they have Joe Burrow, because they have T. Higgins, Jamar Chase, Tyler Boyd, Joe Mixon, and everybody else that they have on offense. They have a defense that's better than a lot of people recognize, and they've been able to string together a couple of pretty successful seasons here. But, but, when I ask you, what was the Bengals' big move? This offseason, it's going to be that they upgraded at left tackle. Now, that's nice. You bring in Orlando Brown, that's that's a real thing. But he's upgrading over a guy in Jonah Williams who was pretty good, too. So it's not a dramatic upgrade. It's not like they went from zero to 60. Okay, they probably went from, I don't know, six to eight, something to that effect. Williams, I'm probably knocking him at, at six. He's a pretty decent player, okay? But the Bengals also 
lost both, not one, but both of their safeties. The Bengals lost Hayden Hurst, and I'm a little bit biased about him since we've been friends for a while, but Hurst is a pretty good football player, and Hurst was a nice fit for the Burrow offense. He hasn't been adequately replaced either. The word out of Cincinnati is that they wanted to make sure, above and beyond anything else, that they protected Burrow's blindside. Again, hats off. That's how you do it. They can still trade Williams, who, by the way, has asked to be traded, understandably, for picks and build themselves up in the draft. But the word is that that's the plan. That's the plan. They're going to be looking to address holes through the draft. Do you know why that is? Because they've got a quarterback who now costs them a zillion dollars. This is why I keep referring to the Kenny Pickett window as being one that exists during his rookie contract when he doesn't cost the zillion dollars and you can still spend on the rest of the team. The Bengals not only are past that point, but they're at the point where those glamorous wide receivers need to be extended internally. And that's going to take up even more cap space, which is why the Bengals are sitting there right now, holding their breath, hoping that the right draft picks are available and that they can just magically show up in Cincinnati and contribute right away. Does that sound to you like the Bengals are still on this dramatic upward incline the way we've all envisioned for a while now? I don't think so. I don't think so. They're going to have to have a hell of a draft. So once more, for emphasis, are the Steelers where the Bengals are? No. But did the Steelers split the season series with the Bengals last year? Winning out there and losing here in Pittsburgh? Yeah. And you'll take a season split with the one team that's legitimately better than you in the division. And hey, you'll also take your arch rival forking over $18 million to a wide receiver who's played 21 total games since 2020, has 67 total catches over all that time. Dude doesn't even get on the field. And they're going to carve up that much cap space for him while they don't even have a quarterback yet. I... I, I feel like I should do the second segment on this, too. When we come back, J1Q. This segment of Daily Shot is brought to you by the personal injury law firm of Luxembourg, Garbett, Kelly, and George, LGKG. They represent people who are hurt in car accidents, who need help with workers' comp, who filed for medical malpractice claims. The attorneys at LGKG have been keeping promises in our region for over 80 years. Learn more about them at lgkg.com or by calling 888-842-5454. Today's J1Q comes from Dan Corwin who says, DK, could the organizational blind spot be the legendary status of head coach longevity? Meaning that the accolades for that position mean that coordinators aren't as valued, so high-caliber guys are not sought out. I'm I'm not going to lie to you here, Dan. My reflex upon seeing just the beginning of your question was to kind of go, ooh, really? Because all this this narrative material that exists about Mike Tomlin and how the Steelers only keep him around so that they can maintain the tradition of having only three head coaches since 1969 and other stuff. Look, it's a factor and it's a point of pride. And Art Rooney has talked about it openly. So did Dan Rooney. Uh, They don't apologize for it. That is, and forgive me for this in advance, that's talk radio claptrap. That's all that is. Okay, they don't think like that. Okay, I'd like to think I've gotten to know these people, and they don't think like that. The reason that Tomlin's been the head coach all this time is the same reason that Bill Cower was the head coach all his time, and the same reason that Chuck Knoll was the head coach all his time, which is that they felt they got their guy, and they wanted to stand by him. So it's not the legend, how did you put it, the legendary status of Steelers coaching longevity or whatever. They are guilty when it comes to underwhelming hires 
of coordinators, with the exception of Dick LeBeau, and I really ought to throw into that uh, Bruce Arians being promoted from wide receivers coach to coordinator was a terrific move. I actually didn't have that much of a problem with the Todd Haley hire, certainly not the way the city did. They scored a lot of points under him. Say what you want about his abrasiveness or whatever. I, I don't really care. They got the job done. They put up 30 points a game. I don't have a problem with any OC that gets me that figure. I don't care how. But when you're talking about finding those difference maker type coordinators, they don't even pursue them. They instead create this atmosphere. And this they, they, they they'll acknowledge this where they want people inside their fold, getting to know the Steelers way and all that other stuff and working their way up from cubicle to cubicle and then making it to the coordinator slot. And I, I don't like the results. Never mind the hiring process because I'm not in those rooms. I don't like the results. I don't look at Randy Feetner, for example, getting promoted on merit. I look at it as he was Ben's quarterback's coach. And Ben wanted him to be the coordinator. So he became the coordinator. That's not a search. That's not a process. But that's not what I hold against him. I hold against him the lack of results. Keith Butler was kept around for seemingly 100 years as the linebackers coach and finally, finally gets his chance as if it were some sort of royal lineage. Once LeBeau is gone, and, you know, I didn't like the results. I liked Dealing with the guy, I like the whole dad gum thing, but I didn't like the results. If you want to fault Rooney for this, go right ahead. If you want to bring in Kevin Colbert on this, since he was the last one to address any sort of coordinator situation, go right ahead. If you want to put that on Tomlin, sure, but you don't have to bring in some talk radio narrative about head coaching longevity or something like that. I'd... I'd really like to think that we can go a little bit of a notch above here with the discourse that we have. Um, that's and, and I'm glad and grateful that you sent the question and everything. I, I'm always happy to have a chance to address stuff like this. But that's that's not it. OK, <laughs> you can tell I'm tiptoeing here. That's not it, my friend. It's just not. They're lousy at coordinators. But that's not why. I appreciate, again, sending the question. I hope everybody appreciates that even when I don't agree or I'll sometimes snap back that it's done respectfully. Let's do this again tomorrow. 